Grenfell Tower has somehow focused everyone's attention. And needless to say that the last couple of years for me and my colleagues uh, have been absolutely manic because people are essentially looking at the buildings and they realise that they need to repair them, they need to fix them, they need to bring them up uh, to code. And I'm not just talking old buildings, I'm talking about buildings that are less than a year and a half old. I have a hospital that I'm dealing with, which is just under two years old. It's had the cladding ripped off, been repaired, and the inside of the hospital is being completely plastered off from top to bottom. Not repaired, not added to, but everything that was done in the first place, ripped out, and starting from scratch. And this is a live hospital. Um, and that's I'd like to say that's unusual, but it's not. Obviously, we are experiencing a lot of this, not just hospitals, but commercial buildings, um, because people have suddenly realised that there's a liability that they have to meet, or have to obviate, or there is a, they have a responsibility, particularly under um, the RRO, where they carry a risk assessment in their building, or they get someone to carry out a risk assessment. And sometimes they discover that the fire stopping is, is, is found wanted. Um, I say not always because risk assessments are not always what they should be. And the people who carry out risk assessments, uh, some of them in my book, you take them around the back of the bike sheds and give them a good level because they should know better on how to do it. Some of them don't even lift ceiling tiles, which is where you will find all the problems. But anyway, fire stopping, help me fire stop. Typically, five minutes is all you get. Fire, and especially smoke, spread through a building much faster than most people think. Every year, about 3.8 million fires occur worldwide. While damage to assets is in the billions, the yearly death toll amounts to 45,000 persons. Much of this could have been prevented if currently installed fire protection had been in place. Architects, planners, engineers, and building owners are responsible for effective fire protection. Oftentimes, they do not realize that fire stop is not an option. It's a clear legal requirement, and negligence or improper execution is a violation of the law. Nearly 60% of fire deaths are not in the room of the fire's origin, and three quarters of all fire deaths are caused by smoke. When there are through penetrations in walls and floors, toxic smoke easily spreads to adjacent rooms. The keys to effective fire protection are both active protection, such as detectors and sprinklers, but also passive protection. Passive means that penetrations in walls and floors have been sealed with approved fire stop products. This principle is called compartmentation. When installed correctly, fire and smoke won't be able to spread from one compartment to another. This allows for safe evacuation of people and protects valuable assets. The thing about compartmentation and fire protection is it's only as good as the products you use. And one always thinks that accidents only happen to other people. That's a false conclusion. It is the responsibility of architects, planners, engineers, and building owners to protect lives and assets by an effective and well-designed compartmentation. Hilti offers innovative and legally compliant, internationally approved solutions. We recommend Hilti to be on the safe side. Although that was all fairly brief and to the point, um, it maybe needs a wee bit of unpacking. Um, they mentioned in the video that you have about five minutes in which to get out. Sometimes it's even less than that. Has anyone here actually been involved in a fire? Had they escaped from a fire? You? Had you taken well, a... In the fire service. Oh yeah, but you were in the fire, right, okay. <laughs> um, I mean, actually, in a, in a building where 
fire alarm is good off, and it turns out it's not a false alarm. Um, I've had to do it twice, uh, just call the owner. Um, one was a hotel in London, and I was staying on the fourth floor, and the fire alarm went off at half one in the morning, and uh, it kind of sharpened your attention, and you think, oh, somebody's, somebody's hit the alarm for the state. And then you open the front, you open the room door, and all you see is smoke in the corridor. And, and I say, a joke. Um, what it was was actually, in that case, uh, it was a downlighter in reception had gone on fire. And my question was, how did the smoke get to the fourth floor? It shouldn't have. There should have been no route for that smoke to get there. So the thing about fire, fire happens much quicker than people, or it develops much faster than people realise. This is a, a demonstration that's carried out in a Finnish laboratory. Um, and what you have here is a, a lightly furnished room, it could be an office, it could be someone's living room, if you go to IKEA. Uh, and there's an ignition source being put on the couch, and it's just been left to, to burn. So after a minute, it starts to get a hold, starts to be quite serious, and probably by this time, the smoke alarm has gone off. Uh, so you rush downstairs, or you rush through to try and put the fire out. Um, my advice, if you see this, you get out. Don't even bother trying to fight it. You might try and fight it in the house, run to the sink, get a basin of water, run back in, Throw the basin and discover you might have put some of it, dampened some of it down. But that's your one and only chance. After that, you definitely have to get out. The speed at which this starts to develop, fire develops roughly, it doubles virtually every 30 seconds. So there you can see three minutes, that's a huge <coughs> going fire. And although you don't see it because of the smoke, those flames are hitting the ceiling and spreading across the ceiling, radiating heat down the way. Now, the temperature of the room, 40 degrees centigrade, that's starting to get a wee bit uncomfortable. Okay, 50 degrees centigrade. So some of the some Australians probably would find that, yeah, I'm used to that. 60 degrees. Now, this is this is where it really starts to burn. 70 degrees, that's the point of third degree burns. After that point, you don't feel anything. Because all your nerves are singed. 100 degrees, boiling point of water. 150 now we're at Sunday roast temperature. 200. It's starting to leap. And you can start to see, you can see bits falling out of the, the, the smoke layer. And that's the plasterboard ceiling disintegrate, calcify, starting to break up. 300 degrees centigrade. At this point, fire starts to become interesting, if it's not interesting already. 400 degrees centigrade. Now you're at what they call auto-ignition of most organic materials. In other words, they will burst into flames because of the heat. And if you watch the top of that coffee table, there it goes, right? Burst into flames. 600 degrees centigrade, got a flashover. Anything in that room that can burn is now on fire. 700 degrees centigrade, structural steel's down to 50% in strength. 800 degrees centigrade. Things are getting pretty toasty. And we're not even at five minutes from the point of ignition. Left, that fire will develop up to about 1100 degrees centigrade. And unless you're wearing factor 20 million, you are not going to walk out of that. Now, there's anecdotal evidence to, to to indicate that the time that it takes from ignition to flashover over the last couple of decades has got extremely short. Can anybody think why? Biting material. Sorry? Biting material. Mm, kind of, but not really. There's one thing we've been doing to our buildings in the last 20 years. Well, that's, I'll come on to that, I'll come on to that one, that's got another implication. But what we've been encouraged to do with our 
our houses over the last 20, 30 years. Insulate them. Keep all the heat in, right? If you imagine a fire in a post-war local authority house, common brick, horsehair plaster, these houses were freezing in the winter because all the heat was absorbed by the brickwork and the plaster. That's what happens in a fire. The heat gets absorbed by the structure. Whereas now, modern housing, you've got plasterboard, which is insulated, you've got lightweight materials that heat up, they don't absorb much heat. So when there's a fire, the heat's bouncing about going, right, what, what can I burn? What can I set fire to? Everything else in the room. And so time to flash over is much, much shorter. That's why you still see a lot of fatalities happening in domestic premises and houses. Because we've made the buildings retain the heat, but the heat just erupts into flash over very quickly. The air tightness side, the air tightness side, so some people would argue that air tightness actually has a beneficial effect because you then starve the fire of oxygen. But our friend over there knows what's going to happen. Because when you starve a fire of oxygen, it doesn't go out, it smoulders. And it just sits there waiting. And then somebody walks in and goes, what if there's a fire in this room? Open the door, in goes the oxygen, and the fire reignites. But it doesn't reignite as in little flames. I'm talking explosion. A thing called black draft. Right? It just, it, and it will blow the windows out, and generally it will kill anyone who enters the room. It is a serious, serious problem. And now, fire engineers are now looking at this as a potential problem for the future. Because in America, where they experienced this a few years ago, firefighters, when they were uh, going to domestic premises, would go to the front door, get down in their hunkers, kick the door open, and use a fan to blow air into the house, to blow the backdrop out to the back of the house, rather than coming towards them. It is a serious problem. So fire happens, as you can see, very, very quickly. The consequences, well, the thing about fire is it's the smoke which does the damage. Uh, and so the only comforting thing you can say about fire is that you'll be dead before the flames get to you. 67% oh, of fire-related deaths are through smoke inhalation. 44% of deaths are not from the room of origin, which needs a little bit of explanation. Because most sentient human beings, when they hear a fire alarm, will go, I say most, um, a vast majority of the population, when they hear a fire alarm, just ignore it. They just ignore it. And one of the best places to see that is a supermarket. Fire alarm goes off, people still going around getting their groceries. Right? The things go, wee, wee, wee. And then they're saying, we need to leave the store, sir. But well, what about my groceries? They'll still be here, don't worry. Smoke travels at uh, 15 to 90 metres per minute. Most people's experience of smoke is maybe a bonfire in the back garden. Smoke rises up into the air, no problem. Put a lid on it, what we call a ceiling. The dynamics are completely different. Right? It starts going horizontal. And rather than just put a lid on it, put it inside a tube what we call a corridor, then it starts moving rapidly. And the other thing is, 47% of survivors couldn't see more than three and a half metres. Three and a half metres is quite significant because it's been found through experiment that once your visibility gets down to 10 feet, you more or less stop because you don't know where you're going. Rather than walk into something you don't know. And it is a reality. This is a picture from an apartment block um, in Manchester. And the marks you see in the wall, that's not some fancy artwork. That's handprints. People getting out of, these, uh, out of their apartments to escape from the building couldn't see where they were going. That's soot residue as they were feeling their way through the smoke along the corridors. And this Building was given its habitation certificate. The 
this is a more significant one. This happened in 1996, and this was Dusseldorf Airport, and there was some hot works going on, welding on the roof. Uh, sparks fell into the roof. It was a, a rooftop car park. Sparks fell into the roof and ignited the roof insulation, which happened to be expanded polystyrene. And the fire spread right through the whole airport. And what made it worse was there was no shutdown of ventilation systems. They just kept working, pumping smoke all over the place. 17 people died, and the airport was fined 11 million US dollars. You can bet that this is now one of the safest airports in Europe when it comes to fire. Now, the picture there is a picture from a first class departure lounge. And as you can see, no damage. The plant's not even wilted. So, what's the problem? The fire service found seven dead bodies in here, all overcome by carbon monoxide poisoning. that fast. They weren't even damaged, no, not burnt, nothing. Carbon oxide poison. And that's the kind of thing that happens. Looking at it from our own point of view in the UK, you're looking at 600 deaths a year. The figure had fallen, uh, but obviously because of what happened two years ago, it's gone up again. Business disruption, 1.3 billion uh, pounds a year, 3.4 million pounds a day, which is serious bit of cash. Cost of arson, 2.4 billion. Now, the reason I put that in there is we try and be good human beings, good citizens, and we try as much as possible to make sure fire won't happen. Unfortunately, there's an element in our society who like fire, not the same way that I like fire. Right? They like fire in the wrong way. And no matter what we try and do, there will always be people who are unstable and will set fire to things. And it's a real, it, it, it's a real thing. But the other thing is the government reports that there's a £7 billion cost to the economy. It's a hidden cost. And fire accounts for 44% of insurance claims. Now, insurance companies they're not charities. They are commercial businesses. They have to make a profit. And if they have to pay out, they need to get the money back in. And one way of doing that is they put insurance premiums up. And the insurance premiums will go up on a business. So the business says, well, that's a cost I need to recover. So they put the cost of their goods up, the cost of their services up. And who pays at the end of the day for this increase? insurance, you and I do, comes out of this. So we're all paying for it. The picture there is um, a fire in 2008. This was a cancer hospital in London. They had a fire in the plant room and it just spread all the way around. Um, they had to evacuate the hospital. They had to find somewhere to put 150 patients. Where do you put 150 patients? It's bad enough trying to get a bed for the night in a hospital. But where do you put 150? They did end up putting them in the local church until they could sort something out. And there were people in the operating theatre while this fire was going on. Um, this, this, the Royal Mars in the hospital here is a, pretty much a, an eye-opener. Um, and after that, uh, we noticed a lot of inquiries coming from hospitals. Uh, particular plant rooms and how to uh, compartmentalise the, the plant rooms. Uh, it's funny how these things sort of focus people's attention. Now, when it comes to fire safety strategy to protect a building, there's various elements. There's fire detection and alert, alarms, smoke detectors, things like that to let us know there's a problem. And then there's the fire escape rooms so that everyone can get out in a safe and tight manner. And sometimes there's fire suppression, which could be sprinklers, but also your extinguishers um, in the building. Um, although sprinklers got a bit of a bad press last week, um, the, the factory that burnt to the ground, the fire in one of the robots burnt the factory to the ground and the sprinklers didn't work. Um, so they got a, a, a cattle. 
cattle, I think it was. And then there's fire compartmentation, which is basically dividing the building up into fire type boxes. And that leads to life safety, massive damage limitation, environmental protection, and sustainability. And it's not just me who says that, it's your own document that says that. Document E. So fire compartmentation is achieved by dividing the building into a series of fire type, smoke type boxes. Uh, we call them rooms. Sometimes it's more than one room, it's a collection of rooms, but that's a strategy that we decided by the architect who designs a building in terms of floor area and uh, use. Which is all fine and well, so he designs fire rated walls, fire rated floors. In this case, a fire rated wall gets built on site. Along comes a plumber with a big healthy drill, small advert. Fills a hole, fires a pipe through, and then walks away. And the main contractor says, Oi, 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 you need to reinstate this. You need to bring this. No, it's nothing to do with me, it's your wall. No, but you made the hole. Aye, but it's your wall. You fix it. And the argument goes back and forth, back and forth. Then the guy comes in and puts the suspenders sealing up, out of sight, out of mind, and everybody's happy. I, I know that sounds a bit flippant, but in my experience, that's what happens on construction sites. So unless that gap around the service um, is reinstated back to the original design fire rated, then that fire rated wall is just a wall that has no fire rating. Ah, but it's only a small hole. It doesn't matter. It's still a hole. It's still a breach. And if that is your attitude, it's only a small hole, well, you can comfort yourself with that when you're next time you're stuck in the M6 with a flat tire and it's tipping down the rain and you've got to get out and change it. You can say to yourself, it's only a small hole. <laughs> the analogy is the same. That small hole has rendered the whole field useless. A small <laughs> hole and a fire rated compartment element will render that whole element useless. And who says we need to do it? Well, unfortunately, we live in a, a world which is governed by rules and regulations, and they are put there for life safety. So we have the building regulations or government standards of Scotland, and these are like bold legal statements. You must do this. Uh, and so people then say, well, OK, how am I supposed to comply? You know, you consult the guidance books. In England, it's the approved document B, where I come from, Scottish Technical Handbooks. And that's fine when you're doing work on a building, design a new building, or doing a refurbishment. If you have an existing building, then you have to abide by the Regulatory Reform Fire Order 2005, or the RROs, it's commonly called. And that asks a building owner to do a risk assessment on their building. And the risk assessment is all encompassing. And when I say all encompassing, it is very, very detailed. If you want to know the different aspects of, of a fire risk assessment, then you can look at the government guides for different types of buildings. And it tells you what you have to look at, even right down to the fire stopper. Now, some of the fire risk assessments I have seen on the, uh, being supplied to people, um, it's obvious the guys doing this have not looked at the guides because in most cases they don't even look at the fire stop and they don't lift the ceiling tiles. In some cases they will put a statement saying this has been a non-invasory uh, inspection and therefore in other words, what they're saying is we've only looked at what's lying about, we've not investigated deeper into the building. Then the construction design and management regulation, which puts a notice on everyone involved in the construction process. Essentially what it says is anything you do to this building, whether you design it, whether you build it, if it has an effect on the health and safety of the people using the building, you need to do something about it. So the wee guy with his drill, put a pipe and then walking away, no, 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 no. He's affected the fire rate, so he needs to do something about it. There's the LPC code of practice for the construction of buildings. Anyone ever looked at this one? No? You should, it's quite shocking. Section 8. The insurer reserves the right to withdraw insurance cover from the site 
if fire protection is not installed at an early stage. So in other words, fire on site, I'm sure I could come along and say, where's this? You're not paying your premium. Sorry, you're not paying, paying out your, your claim. An example of that is a school in Scotland about five years ago, new primary school, uh, it's two weeks from two weeks away from opening, and the main contractor decided not to put the fire doors in. He didn't want to get them damaged by these brutes of builders. And they had a fire, and it was 80% damaged. The fire just whipped its way right through the school, 8% damage. Had to start all over again, and that's because they didn't put things like the fire doors in place. If the fire doors had been in place, they could have reduced the amount of damage. And then there's a joint code of practice on fire prevention and construction sites, which covers the same things. 17th regulations for electricians, there's a bit in there about fire stopping. And then for hospitals, you've got HTM fire code. This is just a snapshot. There's a ton more of this out there. And anyone who turns around and says, I didn't know I needed to do it, is really not playing the game. Yeah. But the primary objective of all fire legislation worldwide is life safety. It's all about protecting lives. It's nothing to do with protecting the building. If it does do that, then that's a happy consequence. If you want to protect the building, then you have to add in other things. You have to go a little bit further in your fire protection, go above the minimum standard. Now, in order to, to fire protect buildings, you have to use products that will work in a fire. And one way uh, we, we demonstrate that and prove that it will work is we carry out fire testing. And fire testing is very important because it then gives us a guide as to how well a product will perform when it's been installed, when it's been used in a building. Perfectly frank, fire testing is a brutal um, spectator sport. Um, it's not a pretty thing when you see the results at the end of it, but then fire is not a pretty thing. Um, but the whole idea of fire testing is to show that the products will actually resist what uh, resist the penetration of fire and smoke. But some people just say, well, why not just burn the hole full of cement? Why not, you know, that doesn't work. To me, that hole in a concrete wall just fill it full of cement again. Unfortunately, it's not quite as easy as that because you have to bear in mind what it is you're putting through that wall cable, plastic pipe, metal pipe. <coughs> Some people say, like, Well, I'll put a metal pipe through there, metal pipe doesn't burn, so I'll just put sand and cement around it. Doesn't quite work, right? Because of the, the thermal expansion and movement of the pipe. In a fire, 
And that's something that's meant to just crack or just fall out. So you have to test products to make sure um, they will do what they're supposed to do. And, when, and the, the main three things that we test for uh, is load bearing capacity, it's ability of, of the ability of the product to actually stand up and not just fall to pieces. And the two important things are the integrity and the insulation. Now, these are the two components which go to form a fire rating. So if someone says, I, I, require, I require a 60 minute fire rating, what that tells me is they require 60 minutes integrity and 60 minutes insulation. Now, integrity is what most people think of. In other words, as long as it stops the fire from coming through, then that's fine. But you've also got to consider the insulation. Best way to visualise it is if I had a hole in the wall, I could fire stop that by nailing a steel plate over it. Fire wouldn't get through it. However, in a fire, that steel plate's going to get almost white hot. And it's going to radiate heat. And if there's anything nearby that that's combustible, that could actually burst into flames. So the idea of insulation is to stop heat penetration. And the break point for that is about 180 degrees above ambient. Approximately 200 degrees centigrade. Once it above, above that, that's you, you've, you've breached the insulation rate of the product. And it's all to do with the, the, ability, the ability of the product to stop heat coming through because the heat can radiate and then cause a problem. In the video, you saw a small furnace test, that's our develop, development test. Um, a pucker test, a full proper test, is a three by three meter furnace uh, in places like uh, Warrington, Warrington Fire Research. Um, so you go there and they have these three by three meter furnaces, and that's a, a photograph from one of our tests of one of our fire, fire stop products. Um, testing used to be done to BS476 part 20 and 22, 23, 24, depending on what you were testing. And BS476 served as well, but we have moved on to the European standard, EN1366. And some people have said, well, why, why are we changing? What's wrong with BS476? And when they ask me that, I, I tell them. I said, you've got to remember when BS476 was introduced. It was introduced in 1987. Now, I think that half of the room could probably remember 1987. Sorry, guys. <laughs> like, I remember 1987. When I started with Hilton in 1985, right, my office consisted of a wooden desk, carpet, and a filing cabinet, and a telephone with a cable on it. Yes, telephones used to have cables on <laughs> My office now, I've got two 27 inch plasma screens, my laptop, loads of cables, and I've got a cabinet full of paper, books, material, reference books. Right? But the important thing is these plasma screens, big lumps of plastic. I never had anything like that in 1985. So a fire, if there had been a fire in my office back then, it would have been a totally different type of fire than one now because of the presence of all this plastic. Whereas plastic, what's it made from? Oil. When plastic melts, it wants to go back to what it was, what it was formed from. It melts and creates this puddle of combustible material like oil. And when oil burns, the characteristic of that fire is totally different from a normal fire. A standard fire, as in BS476, is classed as a cellulosic fire. Cellulose is wood, right? Plastic melts and it burns like oil, and that's a hydrocarbon fire. That's the same kind of fire you get in an oil rig, okay? So, BS476 was okay for then. Now, we live in a different world, which is furnished and 
built differently. You just need to look at look, look at someone's living room. You walk into any, any living room now in Britain, there's a dirty great big lump of plastic sitting in the corner with all these other boxes underneath. Right? You've got this huge big corner full of plastic ready to go. And that's, and we wonder why there's still so many people dying in their houses when it went fires. So this has been replaced. And one, of the re and one of the other reasons why this was replaced is because BS476 is classed as ad hoc. A manufacturer can test whatever he wants. Right? And still say it's been tested to BS476. When we tested our product, this uh, Firebat, we tested it with 10 inch, 10 inch, 10 by 10 uh, metal trunking, 10 inch diameter steel pipes, 6 inch plastic, 4 inch copper, 4 inch steel, K bulbs from 80 millimetres all the way down to 12. Right? And as you can see, we installed it in a plasterboard wall where we actually cut through the metal studs to weaken the wall. Okay? Almost like shooting or setting ourselves up for failure. But that's what happens in reality. This is a photograph from one of our competitors. See, similar product. And they have tested it with 25 millimeter copper pipe with rock wool pipe insulation, non-combustible, and cables maximum size 15 millimeters. And they've installed the product within the studs. They haven't cut through them. And the wall is as stiff as if it was brand new. And yet, they can write in their literature, tested the BS476 part 20, just as we would write tested the BS476 part 20. Which one would you choose? Which one do you think would bear more resemblance to reality? But unfortunately, BS476, that was the weakness of it. European testing, much better. Harmonized standard. Still uses the same heat curve, but now manufacturers have to test specific layouts of services. And they, there is a standard set of cables that they must use when they test the product. Okay. In the past, when I was involved in fire testing, I used to rock up to the local branch of BICC and say, what you got in your skip? I've got a fire test to do. Uh, now you have to use these specific cables for the specific diameters and arranged in a specific way and the, on specific cable trays and laid out the same way. That means that every manufacturer tests the exact same orientation and same penetration system. What it means for you as specifiers as designers is you can then choose from a level playing field. You can then look and say, these have both been tested to European standard. They've carried out the same test. Which one is the better? And there is provision for carrying out sort of more ad hoc stuff um, in other areas, but you have to build these modules. So this is a module for cables. This is a module for mixed penetrations for pipes and cables. And you must follow this, this layout to do the test. It's a more demanding test. It's far more aggressive than BS476. This is more of a 21st century test, right? Because the, the heat flux that's put into this test at the beginning is very, very aggressive, okay? And product, products that have been tested to BS476, if you then test them to this, you get totally different results. The product hasn't changed, just the testing has changed. But this is more relevant the types of fires that are happening in buildings now. And the good thing about EN is, uh, the EN test is, uh, as a manufacturer, you can then have, uh, you can apply, apply to have a European technical assessment, which will then allow you to CE mark the products. Because at the moment, there is no harmonized standard for fire stock. Hopefully it'll come soon. Um, and so CE marking is voluntary. And the other good thing about this testing is it's, uh, it gives you European wide acceptance. Um, and the other thing is that 
most EN standards are written in an ISO context with a view uh, to marketing it throughout the world. Other things that we do to the products, we test them for acoustics. Um, we find that uh, acoustics is uh, quite high in demand. Um, in fact, in some projects we've actually been uh, involved with in the past, acoustics are more important than the fire rating of the product, uh, particularly in the schools. Uh, they're more worried about the little darlings going deaf rather than being burned alive, I think. Um, air leakage, come back to your point, uh, we test uh, the fire stop front for the air leakage, uh, whether they can resist water penetration. We also carry out accelerated aging on the product to see whether it can actually cope um, with things like uh, preschool cycling. Electrical resistance, mold resistance, movement and seismic load bearing impact flashes. All of these are additional attributes for a fire stop products. Um, so the products can be used not just for fire stop. Because in the past, if, for example, you, you're concerned about acoustics, you might have to fire stop around the service and then think of some way of providing an acoustic seal to augment the fire stop. Um, in the case of our own products, you can use the product to do, install one product to do more than one job. The types of products we have, uh, very, for very simple products like fire rated silicon used around metal pipes that allows the pipe to flex and move. Um, where you've got the uh, non combustible pipes fitted with insulation, which is in a lot of cases, then you need to use an intumescent product to crush down the insulation because 99% of the insulation used in this country is combustible. Unless you want to spring for rockwool uh, rock sleeves uh, or uh, corlet sleeves. They're very expensive, but things like the Phenolix, the Armaflex, polyethylene, these are all combustible. And so you need to use something around the insulation to crush it and close it. Movement joints, buildings are full of joints. Um, because if you don't provide the joints, the building makes its own joints. We call them cracks. So uh, and these joints and firewalls, fire floors have to be have to have the same fire rating, so as the as the element itself. Edge of slab joints behind cut and walling and cladding systems. Um, we have we have seen a huge upsurge in inquiries for um, cavity barriers and slab edge seals to do with cladding. Funny that. Combustible pipes, plastic pipes. In the last 10 years, it is amazing the amount of different types of plastic pipes that's come onto the market. If you think it's quite prolific here, you should see what the continents are. They have got plastic pipes that you would never dream of. Uh, all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff. 30, 40 years ago when I started this game, plastic pipe was a PVC pipe. Now, polypropylene, ABS, you've got a uh, cross linked polypropylene, cross linked PVC, you've got combi pipes, you've got acoustic polypropylene pipes, which are triple layer. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And I suppose you would use something like an intermessive collar. Um, one of the things that, that happened, has happened over the years is is guys putting pipes through building elements. Um, they tend to just put them through. They don't care how they put them through. And so as a result, you get pipes through at an angle. Uh, and then one of the worst ones is the pipe bend. The pipe comes through the wall and then just suddenly bends down. And you can't fit anything around it. Or the pipe is fitted tight in the corner. You can't get the fire collar around it. We developed a fire collar that will actually treat all of these applications and make things a lot, lot easier on the construction site. We even do a cast-in device, um, which kind of makes sense um, when you think about it, because in, in construction, if you're putting a pipe through a, a concrete slab, the traditional way of doing it, cast the slab, then come along, core a hole in the slab, then put the pipe through it, then fill the hole back in again. So you do the job twice. Um, whereas in, or other cases, you can cast in timber pocket and then you've got to rip the timber out 
and then you go to throw the timber into the next waste bin because it's full of nails. And, and well, before you rip it out, you've got to put pad over the top of it, which then becomes a trip hazard because everybody keeps stubbing their toes on them. This is a device, plastic device that you just cast in, nail it to the former, throw the concrete around it, and when you want to put a pipe through it, just snap the lid off it, drop the pipe through, sit down. And the big advantage is it's already fire stopped. And the good thing about it is it allows uh, close fitting of pipe work to the soffit, um, which is very important in apartment blocks uh, because architects want and developers want to try and reduce the amount, uh, or reduce the size of the, uh, uh, the surface zone. And then cables, buildings are full of them, miles of this stuff. Um, and we have different products for uh, for this. Um, the one on the left, the one that give, uh, the thing that gives it away there is the, the cable ladder. You're obviously not going to put a cable ladder in that size for two 12 volt cables. What that indicates to me is that somebody's coming back and putting more cables in there at a later date. And what you see there is a fire stop that you take it out, put it back in again, uh, rather than a fire stop being put in and then the electrician coming along with. Apologies to anyone who, who might have been an electrician. They come along with a favourite drilling machine, a 16 ounce claw hammer, and then they wreck the fire stump and then don't tell anyone about it. That can be taken back out, put back in again, and reinstated. Um, cable collar, again, that's to um, deal with a common problem, uh, particularly uh, where cables are passing through partition walls. Again, favourite drilling machine that's used there, 16 ounce claw hammer, smack, 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 ragged hole, cables just thrown through them, that is just fitted over the top and that's it's sealed. There's no cutting, trimming, backfilling it, the product's just fitted and anchored over the top of the hole. And then the, the one on the right, CFX foam, uh, is very useful, it's a, it is a proper fire rated foam, it is not to be confused cans of yellow stuff or pink stuff, which we are seeing less and less of these days. Um, yeah, because that is not a fire stop. Right? I'll tell you now, the stuff that comes in the can, although it's fire rated, it is not a fire stop. Okay? If you use it around a bunch of cables, you will get a three minute resistance. It will just Burn. Um, the Association of Specialist Fire Protection about three years ago carried out a, web, uh, carried out a demonstration fire test and they, they built a wall and on one half they had good fire stop, on the other half they had pipe foam. Right? Now one of the penetrations was a 110mm plus PVC pipe. And I'll tell you now, I watched the test, 110mm PVC pipe lasted longer than the pipe foam. That's how bad this stuff is. So if you ever see anyone using it, pick up the nearest bit of two by two and apply repeatedly to the back of their head saying, do not use that material. Again, if you've got cables in a building, uh, or the building is maybe a phased project and you're putting the cables in at a later date or taking cables back out, or if some like a data, uh, data center your cables are getting changed all the time. These products are reusable. Uh, cushions are a, quite a traditional way of doing it. Uh, the one there on the right is a speed sleeve, and uh, it's fast stop it doesn't get any easier than that. Bolt cutter, put the plaster board, push it in, screw on two flanges, that's it. That's a two-hour fast stop. And you can open and close it, Cables in, cables out. Um, data centers just love them because they're not having to call people in all the time to repair the fire stopping. They just open those up and close them. Uh, and we showed it to showed it to guys in Sellafield. And the guys just went, tell them about this. And we told them about it. The next day they ordered ten thousand pounds worth. Just like that. They just they said, this is perfect for us. We've got cables going in and out all the time. The problem we have is these things have to be repaired all the, all the time. Guys are in and out, in and out, in and out. Sellafield's not a place where you want people just being 
and in a and in a and in a Then we come on to my favourite, the other service, the hampers. If I had a pound for every one of these I've had to deal with, I'd be in the Bahamas. Seriously. Um, this must be about the most badly installed service in a building. I have, I, I've seen every permutation of the installation of these things. Um, I've, I've got to stage where nothing really is new now to me. I'm waiting for it, but essentially these things are very, very badly installed. I would even predict, I, I could safely predict in about 95% of the buildings in the UK Um, so we get this metal ducting, and to stop fire going through the compartment walls, floors, you pick one of these dampers down there in B, or intermission dampers there in C. Um, but it's quite tricky because it's thin sheet metal, and sheet metal in fire is it's not very good. It tends to warp and distort and twist. And what happens is these dampers are supposed to be installed in line with the walls or in line with the floor. Um, and the wall itself and the floor has to be properly treated and dealt with. In the case there's a partition wall, you can see there up in there. The opening has been lined with metal framing. Excellent, the way it should be done. Now, it's not us that say this, right? All the plasterboard manufacturers tell you in their technical manuals, you cut a hole for services. In my plasterboard wall, you have to frame it and line it. Otherwise, the wall goes all like this. It's a weakness. Does it happen on site? Very rarely. Honestly, guys will just rip a hole in it, fire the service through. It's not framed in line. <coughs> and the dampers positioned in line with the wall, as you can see there and there. <coughs> and they've even been fitted with the builder's expansion frame. This was one of the rarities, that's why I took a photograph of it. Then you can fast all this proper. And in a floor, then you need to make sure that it's in line with the floor, but it should also be independently supported and restrained. Okay, you don't rely on the fire stop to do that. However, this is what we frequently find. Dampers not in line with the wall. Dampers not even fitted with a builder's frame because the buyer has said, we don't need those. You can save money. And then someone reaches his rod and goes, it's a 300 millimeter circular duct, so let's core a 400 millimeter hole. Ah, the damper is square. Oh, we can't get it in the hole, so we need to stick it outside the wall. And the damper here, as you can see, has been installed by Paul Daniels. It's levitating. There's nothing holding it up apart from the ductwork on either side. And when you read all the manufacturers' instructions, action air, advanced air, all these people, you know, trucks, dampers have to be independently and structurally supported. That hung in midair, doing nothing. Because if the the ductwork collapses, the damper goes with it. Right? It doesn't hover, it doesn't stay in place. So then people present me with things like that and go, can you supply a fire stop detail for that? And we say, yeah, we can. 
Then we present them the detail and they look at it and they go, you're having a laugh. And I'm saying, no, that's what you need to do. There must be an alternative. Yeah, get the guy back who's done the duck work and tell him to do it properly. Then it'll be easy. So the kind of things that we present people with are things like this. Very commonly, dampers are hung on these things. And what are they commonly called in the business? Trapezes. Right? Drop rods, bit of channel, it's a trapeze. What does a trapeze do? Right? So you think, well, how's that going to swing? What's this? It's a steel duct. Right? Now, for the sake of illustration, it's been cut. That steel duct goes away up to the other wall. What you have is a line of steel fixed between two walls. Then a fire breaks out. What does steel do? It expands. And as it expands, what does it want to do to the dampers? Shove them out the wall. And if that's a partition wall, what does the partition wall want to do? It wants to come in the way. So that partition wall does that, the damper does that. The differential difference between these two. Can anybody have a guess at the kind of levels of differential displacement? 50? 60 mil? Try 150. It can be as much as 150. And if you've got some skanky fire stock around there, it's gone. It's like the movie, gone in 60 seconds. Right. So what you need to do is stop this moving. One way is using 45 degree bracing. First time I showed that to someone, they burst out laughing. It was a guy from building these self establishments who'd actually just wrote, written a paper on fire dampers. Anyway, you're joking. I says, no, think about it. I'm going to explain it to me. Like, oh, I can see that. He says, how do you know this? He says, because Hilary Austria carried out a whole pile of testing with trucks, dampers, and came up with all these design solutions. Because they discovered what the problems were. If you have the damper in the wall, the builder's frame on it, that's hunky dory. Because then you can seal it. However, the damper, like the previous photograph, or the photograph before, is unsupported. I'll let you in the secret. We've got a fire stop product that can support these things. It's a high strength mortar. However, it doesn't take away from the fact that the damper actually should be independently supported. Out of line dampers. I have actually been presented with an application where the damper was out of line by two meters. How can anyone get that distance? How can they get that wrong? You know, even if you weren't using a tape measure and you were using, you know, I'm going to I'm going to measure by cubit, you still would wouldn't get two meters, right? That's two meters, right? But that's what they had, and they said we can't change it. So the principle behind this detail is that's the compartment line. But what you're doing with this detail is you take the compartment line up there, bring it there, up to the damper, back along, and back up through the wall. which is all well and good, but you need to stop that from moving. So you usually have to fit a frame on the other side. And that frame is connected to the duct, and it's to restrain it. But it also, it also performs a second function, because if that wasn't there, the duct would go collapse and in itself. That there is fixed 
to Dr. and Forsyth to be in Dorset. Stop it collapsing. And in cases, in those cases, that's when we, that's when we execute what's called an engineering judgment. We use all the basic test information and guidance documents that relate to the application to come up with a technical solution. Uh, sometimes the um, the application is a bit out there. Uh, this was one uh, where the ductwork was going down into a particular room on this job. Uh, those with good eyesight can see which job it is at the top there, purpose and B. This duct was going down into the reactor room. And these ducts had been installed when Hurtlesson B was built back in the 70s. Yeah. This duct was clad in expanded polystyrene with a cotton fabric around it, which had been painted several times with gloss paint. In other words, the duct had been wrapped with solid petrol. And the guy said, do you think we need to do something about that? I said, well, I think you do. I think you really need to do something about it. Um, so we came up with a detail uh, for this <coughs> um, so we could actually rectify the problem. Sometimes it's a little bit more of a, an involved detail, a bit more complicated. Again, this is, this is similar to the sketch I showed you before. And the damper is out of line um, with the wall. And we're actually reinforcing the duct where it goes through the wall. We're bracing it against the wall so that the wall and duct are all tied together. Um, the other thing as well is drop rods that are used. And this is something people don't really consider. Um, I have seen dampers hung on, try not to use the trade name, but ugh, we're all grown-ups, gripple wire, right? I've seen dampers hung on gripple wire, right? The gripple wire is a two and a half millimetre thick piece of steel braided wire, right? And I've seen dampers hung two metres from the soffit on these things. What do you think a piece of two and a half millimetre steel wire will do in a fire? stretch that piece of nickel elastic, honestly. And the other thing is, the other thing about the gripper was, the ratchet that it uses is made from zinc. Zinc in a fire is not any better than plastic. And we have to say to people, you've got to support these things properly. Drop rods, if the drop rod's even more than a metre long, M10 drop rod, you're still going to wrap it around the wall. And if you want back up on that, look at advanced stairs, technical handling. So, that's just a bit of dampers to finish with. In summary, fire, costly, in terms of life, financial losses, social disruption. Because it is a big social disruption. Right? Because one of the things I never said was the cost of fire. According to the Association of British Insurers, one in four businesses who have a serious fire, I'm talking about a real serious fire, stay in business. The other three go out of business. And that has an effect on us. Because when business goes out of business, people then become unemployed. They then claim benefit. Who's paying the benefits? Right? Those of us who are in gainful employment through our taxes are paying for benefits. Okay, that's what the benefit system is there for. But that's an added cost. And the other thing is, it's not just the business itself. It's all the other businesses that feed into that business support it. Compact rotation is used to pass passively limit fire spread with consequences. It does. It contains the fire. If it's done properly, it will contain the fire for a given period of time and stop it breaking out. The fire stop is an essential part of a fire strategy. It's a minimum. It's in there. It requires it. You look at all the documents, even the fire engineering documents, all list fire stopping as a necessary part. In fact, when you look at the standard for fire engineering, when you start, before you get to the calculation stage, it starts with one basic assumption, right? And what it means is that in order to use these calculations for fire engineering, you assume that the building is imperfect. In other words, there are no gaps or openings in the building. Will that make a difference? Yes, it does. It can make a serious difference. Now, fire stopping is a legal requirement. It's there, it's written in. It's written as law. 
Okay, the building regulations say you have to stop far from spreading. How do you do that? Well, you stop it spreading because you build compartment walls and floors. And they have to be built in such a way that they stop the fire from spreading. And any service, any service pipe cable passing through a fire rated roller floor has to be has to be fire stopped so that you get back to the original design fire rate. And the fire stop products must have relevant and appropriate testing to demonstrate performance or compliance. Just because it says in the manufacturer's literature testing the BS four seven six, that does not say that the product's fit for purpose. I have seen products used by contractors that say, well, look, look, tested the BS-476. And I've got copies of these test reports. They say, yeah, but that's only been tested in a linear joint and a bottle up wall. You're using it around metal pipes and a plasterboard wall. Where's the test evidence for that? How can you make such a leap of faith that you can. It's a brave man or woman who does make that leap. Yeah? But what they have to remember is if they do that, then they are actually carrying design and specification liability. So when it all goes wrong, don't be surprised if someone goes, we're here to take your house. And car stock products sometimes are required to provide additional attributes, as I mentioned before, things like acoustic, seismic resistance, etc. Et so that's just a, a fly through. Um, I hope that's been uh, informative. Um, I don't know if anyone's got any questions or points of contention. Well, what was the main issue then, Tom? Why did the fire spread so fast? Why did it spread so fast? There's a very good there's a very good report written by a guy called Ian Abley, uh, and this guy he, he, people underestimate him. He's a very clever bloke, uh, and Ian Ian got a hold of the original construction drawings and went through them, and he what he basically said was, I mean everybody's going about the cladding being combustible would be so. It's like putting an Asda bag over the building and it just burns away, but it's partly, partly. Grenfell essentially was an old building with a cladding over it. And the old building had windows in it. And there's a gap between the old building and the cladding. And the, old, and, the, and the new cladding was to have windows in it as well, otherwise it would be a pretty miserable place to live. So they went, we need to connect these. So they connected it with a little box construction. So you open your window there, you've got quite a big ledge. And this was done all the way up and all the way around the building. And then he said, well, the building regulations say we've got to have cavity barriers in. So they put the cavity barriers in. It's not a barrier at all. And these were ventilated cavity barriers. In other words, you had to leave a gap at the front of them because this is a ventilated system. Okay? These lightweight cladding systems are ventilated. Um, so the, and the reason for that is that the pressure in high winds Pressure outside equals the pressure inside the cavity, and therefore you don't get any suction of pressure forces. So that means you can use lightweight systems. So the cavity barriers are put in place, and the vents uh, ventilate the fronts on them. Fair enough. There's test information to show they work. But the problem was this stuff here wasn't fire rated. Way up. Burn me, burn me, 
There was other factors as well. Um, for example, these apartments had fire doors fitted to them at the beginning. Some people decided they didn't like the look of the fire doors. I've got a mate who'll fit PVC doors. Nice PVC door. And what's the other thing about fire doors? What have they got? What are they fitted with? Owners, right? People in the apartment were going, bags of groceries. So it wasn't just one thing. It was a whole series of things that allowed that. Yes, the cladding had something to do with it because tests showed that, okay, it wasn't the greatest thing in the world. But if it had just been the cladding, and this was all done right, it would have been a case of, oh, building in London catches fire. I mean, Parliament storms the ground. In Parliament today, that's what it would have been. I was, I was on holiday in Austria at the time, and we've been out walking, wife had gone out for sure, and I thought, I'll watch the world news. And I just, I couldn't believe what I was watching. It was almost akin to watching 9-11 again. I, I just looked at this thing and I thought, I knew this was going to happen. Because in the fire industry, there's quite a few people in the fire industry have been predicting this was going to happen. For like 20 years, we've been saying it's going to be a disaster. And that is when people are going to sit up and take notice that this fire protection malarkey is to be taken seriously. That's what's happened. Yes, in the past, some people, no problem, fire protection, yeah, yeah, yeah. The general thrust in the marketplace was for oh, fire protection. It's just a nuisance. Just a nuisance. Now it's like first time in their mind. But yes, that, that there was many factors in, in the rental. And these were just some of the things I, I picked up in my reading. I say, you can go what day, you know? He's on uh, LinkedIn. Um, and he puts these things up. To, to look at. But his, his, his is one of the best reports I've seen. 